Okay, perfect. We are live. Great. So what I'm going to start doing is letting folks in. And then so we can start on time. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Okay, we started maybe a little bit early, but I know folks will be coming in. Are you also recording? Yes, we're recording. <laughs> we're on, we're on, but we can <laughs> chit chat. Um, <laughs> we're just going to wait for some more folks to come on. Thank you for our attendee who's here. Thanks so much. Yeah. For to get started <laughs> soon. Um, just going to wait for some more folks to come in. Perfect. And feel free, like you can also, you know, have your camera off if you want to, whatever you want to do. Yeah, I think I'll just uh, put my camera off for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank y'all so much for being here. Um, we're, we're just going to wait for a few moments uh, for, so more folks can come in. I see that there's some people watching on YouTube Live, which is great. Um, and for those that are here, please feel free to share your name, your pronouns, where you're from, and what brings you to the conversation. And super excited soon to let Carol Ann take over and lead us into a wonderful discussion about pioneers long before Muasi, um, which Carol Ann told me about, thank God I, I said correctly, but Muasi means me too in French. So we're gonna get started in a few moments, but like I said, please feel free to share your name, your pronouns of what brings you here. Thanks, thank y'all so much. All right, we're gonna wait for a couple more minutes. And then Caroline, I'm gonna let you take over so we can 
start on time. I see that there's more folks on YouTube live watching. So great. Um, and like I said, everyone, please feel free to share your name, your pronouns and where you're from. And then like in a 403, 404, we're going to get the conversation started. Okay, so what we're going to do is just get get the, uh, you know, teaching started. And then as more people come in, they'll just be joining us. Thank y'all for being here. Um, super excited for the teaching. Thank y'all to everyone who's here in, in the Zoom and also on YouTube Live. My name is Jamie Swift. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the executive director of Black More Radicals, which is a Black feminist advocacy organization dedicated to uplifting and centering Black women and gender expansive people's radical activism around the world. Um, and I'm also the executive director for the School for Black Feminist Politics, which is Black Men Radicals, Black Feminist Political Education Hub and Initiative, where we interrogate, explore, and pay Black feminists from around the world to expand the frame of reference of Black politics through the power of Black feminisms. I know that was a mouthful, but here we are. Right, so I'm super excited to have Carol Ann Souffrant today lead a powerful teaching on pioneers long before Moasi, Black women, rape culture, and digital black, digital feminist activism in Quebec. Um, and I was super excited that Carol Ann reached out because it's I think it's very important to interrogate how Black women and gender expansive people are surviving, organizing, and thriving in Canada. Um, and so, which often gets neglected, right? But before I get started to introduce the amazing Carol Ann Souffrant, I wanna establish this space. And if you're not familiar with this space, Black Mirror Radicals, we pride on our, ourselves on curating safe spaces for Black women and gender expansive people to learn, to listen, to, to commune with one another. So we do not accept or allow any transphobia, homophobia, queerphobia, ableism, white supremacy, you name it, we don't accept it. And if you cannot abide by those rules, I will have to kick you out of the webinar. So that's just my disclaimer, right? And just please honor our guests. Um, and also we just wanna send out solidarity to Haiti right now, who's, who's the country's been impacted by earthquake. So let's just, um, you know, and all political unrest. And so let's just keep Haiti at the forefront of our hearts and minds today. Um, and yeah, so just wanted to put that out there. Also, like I said before, please feel free to share your name, your pronouns and where you're from. That means a lot to myself and our guests because we have people from around the world who tune into our teachings. So please feel free to do that, don't be scared. And I really wanna now introduce the amazing Carol Ann Souffrant who will be leading, like I said, this wonderful, wonderful teaching, but Carol Ann, I have to do you justice and you know introduce you properly. So born in Montreal and of Haitian descent, Carol Ann Souffrant, pronoun she, her, L, is an award-winning social worker, columnist, author, and public speaker and researcher. She is a doctoral candidate in social work at the University of Ottawa and a Fulbright and Veneer scholarship recipient. Her thesis project focuses on sexual violence experienced by Black women in Quebec in connection with the Moisi Me Too movement of 2017 and Aggression non denunci, and uh, I just want to say content warning, um, rape before I say the, the hashtag, um, but that means been raped never reported movement of 2014. Carol Ann holds a bachelor's and master's degree in social work from McGill University and a college diploma in youth and adult correctional intervention from the College of Honestique. 
She has worked as a volunteer counselor and social worker with populations with a variety of psychosocial difficulties, as well as in the health and social services network for the past 16 years. She is a part-time lecturer at the University of Montreal. Carol Ann was so recently selected as a 2020 United Nations Fellow for People of African Descent by the Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights in the context of the UN International Decade for People of African Descent, 2015 to 2024. She is fluent in English, French, and Haitian Creole. So thank you so much, Carol Ann, and I'll let you take it away. Super excited and honored to have you as a curator for this wonderful teaching. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, I, I really appreciate your mention about uh, Haiti because my parents are from Haiti. My family is safe in Canada, but it still affects me because that's where my roots are, are from. Um, so I, I really appreciate that we keep uh, Haiti in our thoughts and prayers uh, during this presentation. Um, and yes, uh, thank you for introducing me. It's always a bit uh, because I've been active in Montreal in Quebec for like, uh, quite a long time. I started when I was a kid and now I'm almost 30 and I never stop. Uh, so it's really important for me to be engaged for social justice and human rights uh, as, I, as, as, as it's been mentioned. Uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for accepting my offer. <laughs> I like doing public speaking and presenting to various groups. And I think it's really important to uh, invest in platforms like Black Women Radicals because um, Black women are, 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 have always been here for a long time all over the world. And I feel I feel it's really important to connect with other uh, Black feminists uh, all around the world. So I'm really thrilled to be here. So I'll, I'll be sharing my screen right now. Um, just one sec. Oops. Technology, okay. I think you can see my screen now. So I'm just gonna do full screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, so this is gonna go here. Okay. Okay, so my presentation is titled uh, Pioneers bef uh, Long Before Moi Moi means uh, me too in French, basically. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the context of uh, the Me Too movement in Quebec because it really had a huge impact uh, in this Canadian province uh, for various reasons that I will just uh, talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but before we start, uh, I know now it's common practice to do uh, land uh, acknowledgement, uh, and I think it's important to do so because uh, Canada has been built uh, um, on uh, unceded Indigenous lands. Uh, I am from Montreal. Uh, this is where I spent most of my life. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am from uh, and I am on unceded um, Indigenous land. The Kanyagaga Nation is recognized as the custodian of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Yojagi, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future and our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. And I know that sometimes these land acknowledge acknowledgement can be a bit um, performative. Uh, and so I think it's important to do something concrete when we mention um, that we, you're an, an indigenous unceded land. So there's an amazing organization in Montreal called the Native Women's Shelter. Uh, so if you, you can reach out to them to donate uh, money or, or anything that you, you wish to support this organization, I really encourage you to do so. I think they will be more than happy uh, to receive your support or donations. Uh, because they do really important work with Indigenous women in the city. And I think it's important to, to um, support those organizations who are doing this work, uh, really important work. Um, so as it's been mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, today the Me Too movement. So that means that we're going to talk about uh, sexual violence, uh, rape culture. Uh, so these topics might be a bit triggering for some of you. So don't hesitate to take care of yourself during this presentation. Uh, I'm gonna try to talk about these topics as a, not lightly because it's not a light topic, but I'm gonna try to, to not um, to be un unnecessarily uh, graphic about anything of, during this presentation, but it, this topic might be a bit triggering. So please, if you need to take a break, uh, to drink water, uh, to, to take a walk, please do so, I won't be offended. 
So please do what's best for you during uh, this pre presentation, because I know uh, we might have many survivors uh, who are watching. Um, so the, the objectives of this presentation, basically, um, I'm gonna talk about like the, the history of the Me Too movement and hashtag activism against rape culture in Quebec, Canada. Um, and I'm gonna talk about, there's a lot of dynamics at play uh, in Quebec when it comes to black women. We're often um, invisibilized or even made hyper visible uh, at the same time. Um, and we've been uh, here for a long time, but often our work is not um, put forward or acknowledged or even documented when it comes to research. Um, and I'm gonna talk about my doctoral uh, thesis project. So I'm entering my third year of my PhD in social work. Uh, so I'm still early on in, in the process of working on this topic. But my goal is really to produce um, some type of archive of, of Black women uh, activism against rape culture in Quebec in French, uh, because there's really a lack of data and research on this topic. And that doesn't mean that we're not active and that we were not here. It just means that there's not uh, many scholars uh, who are in academia who can do this work and who are documenting this work. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to do uh, with my research. And so that's why I'm, I'm saying it's an ongoing um, project. So my presentation will, won't be perfect, uh, but it's still an ongoing project and I'm still documenting um, to make sure that the, there's research done about the, the resistance and the activism of Black women in Quebec when it comes to this very important uh, topic. So I'm, yeah, I was introduced earlier, so I just want to introduce myself a little bit again. Uh, I just want to mention that I'm, I am a survivor myself, so I shared my story publicly in 2020 and an op-ed that I wrote in La Presse, which is a major uh, newspaper here in Quebec. Um, and it led to all, after I published this op-ed, it led to a lot of situations. When we talk about invisibility and hypervisibility, uh, I was, uh, and, and it was just after uh, the, the, the George Floyd uh, death, and it had a huge impact in Montreal. Uh, and because I am a black woman, so I was a bit at the intersection of those two social movements at the time. And I helped uh, organize a protest also in Montreal on uh, July 19, 2020, um, regarding sexual violence. Uh, so it made me a bit visible really quickly last year. So I was getting invited to many, many, many places uh, to speak about my experience and my research. Uh, and that came with, uh, like, it was, it, <laughs> there was a lot of, um, not dilemmas, but, um, um, I don't know what's the word in English, but like these enjeux, like something that some things needed to be a bit um, more done in a more thoughtful way, uh, because I was like uh, getting invited in so many places because I wrote this op-ed and because there was also like the conjunction conjunction of those two social movements at the time. Uh, but I'm going to speak about that a little bit later. Uh, so I'm currently uh, finishing a book that I'm writing uh, on these uh, themes uh, that I'm hoping to get published in a few months. Uh, and I'm also a social worker by training. So I just wanted to, to mention that I, I have also have a lived experience on the topic of uh, sexual violence. So uh, the story of the Me Too movement. So I know most of you know that uh, Tarana Burke uh, is, is known as the person who has founded the Me Too movement in, 20, in 26. So uh, where it all began is that uh, Tarana Burke, she's a uh, community worker, activist, she's a survivor herself. Uh, in the 90s, she was working in a day camp um, with, uh, with young girls. And one of the girls who, her, who she calls heaven to protect her privacy, um, one day came to her and disclosed that she was a sexual assault survivor, uh, that she was being sexually assaulted by um, her, the partner of her mother. But Tara Nabrook at the time, she's a survivor herself. Uh, she couldn't... Um, hold that secret to it was really difficult for her to receive that that uh, secret from heaven so she told heaven to go see someone else and basically heaven left the day camp and never came back and it's still something that tarana Burks thinks about a lot today she mentions she mentions that on different platforms and interviews uh, that she wishes she could have said me too to have a me too i am a survivor and me too, I went through this and it's not your fault. She wishes she could have said those words to this 12 year old girl um, that she feels in some way that she has 
kind of let down, even if it was not the intent, but that's basically what happened. Um, and now, and 20, uh, not now, but later in uh, 2006, she started this, the Me Too campaign uh, to really raise awareness on uh, sexual violence against Black women and girls. Uh, because very often we tend to be forgotten, uh, left out of the conversation when it comes to this issue uh, and programs, intervention, policies, research. So she really wanted to, to um, it was a, a really a campaign for social justice and to really um, create some kind of solidarity between survivors of Black communities and female survivors of Black communities. And that was, that was the goal of the Me Too movement. That was the start of the Me Too movement. So basically, to about 10 years later, uh, Alisa Milano, who is an actress, uh, she's known for her role in, in the series uh, Charmed uh, that I watched when I was, uh, when I was younger. Um, she basically tweeted this after um, the New York Times and the New Yorker revealed uh, that Harvey Weinstein, who is an Hollywood uh, producer, um, sexually harassed and assaulted women for decades, and, and that he basically was making those uh, his, his victims um, sign confidential, confidentiality contracts so they would never speak. Uh, so the, this was revealed by the New York Times and the New Yorker in 2017, October 2017. Uh, so a few days later, Alisa Milano, she uh, basically Carol Ann, let me see. Hi everyone, let me see. I think Carol Ann's uh, internet uh, went out, but please bear with us as we, as she comes back, cause I know she'll come back, but thank y'all so much for joining and being here. Um, Busayo, thank you for sharing uh, why you're here. Appreciate it so much. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here. I know Carolyn will get back on in a few moments, but please bear with us with the technical difficulties. Hey, Carolyn. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Okay, sorry. Uh, where did, did it cut? Like... <laughs> It cut up when you were talking about um, kind of like the origins of uh, the Me Too movement. You talked about Tarana Burke, and then you went on to talk, talk about the tweet with Alyssa Milano and Harvey Weinstein. Okay. Okay. So I'll restart. <laughs> Here. Thank y'all for okay. being so patient. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, basically, she tweeted, uh, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write Me Too as a reply to this tweet. Uh, this was a few days after uh, the New York Times and the New Yorker revealed that Harvey Weinstein, um, who, is an, who is an Hollywood producer, uh, had been sexually harassing and assaulting women for decades. Uh, and, he, he, and he was making uh, his victims sign a confidentiality agreement so they wouldn't speak. Uh, but basically, this, was, this, was, this came out in October 2017. So Alisa Milano tweets this. And, and it becomes uh, viral because she's an, a world known actress, so it becomes viral. Uh, so basically uh, the impact of the Me Too movement is really uh, worldwide. And I think it's important to understand that very often we talk about the Me Too movement, but I really see um, that there's many Me Too movements uh, in different contexts of the world and France, Quebec, Italy, Spain, China, Norway, Vietnam, Tunisia, Russia, just to name a few. Um, and it's important to mention that when this happened, like many black women were like, whoa, wait a minute, this was this idea, there was a black woman who had this, who had this idea before. And Alessia Milano, I think she just wasn't aware, uh, but she mentioned uh, there, uh, it came to me that someone else had this idea before. Uh, so she learned about the story of heaven, she learned about tearing a bird, and she just recognized that Taryn Burke is the is the real founder of the Me Too movement, and that's why we we recognize the work of this of this woman who has been working for decades on this topic. Uh, and I think it's really important to recognize her work because um, it kind of it still got whitewashed, if I can say it like that, because uh, we had to create another hashtag, say her name, to make sure that we don't forget about black women and girls. Um, and but at the same time, I think it's important to um, to remember that the Me Too movement really had an impact an impact worldwide including in Quebec. 
Um, and in Quebec, Quebec is one of the provinces in Canada where um, there was the most impact, and I'm going to just go into a minute why. So before the Me Too movement of October 17, we had two other uh, similar uh, Me Too waves, if I can say it like that. So we had Agression non dénoncée, uh, which means being raped never reported in 2014. We had Stop Culture du Viol in 2016. And there was another wave in July 2020. Um, and that's when I organized, I helped organize this protest, the picture that you're seeing, I, I helped organize uh, this. Um, and basically, uh, it, it really, um, there's a lot of differences between each of those waves. Um, they, it didn't, they, each of them did not have the same impact. Um, so if we compare all of those waves, so Agression au Dénoncé in 2014, um, those were started by two um, uh, then journalists, uh, Sue Montgomery and Antonia Zervizias in Canada. So basically the goal of this hashtag was really to talk about in a moment where uh, someone had been sexually assaulted and they decided not to report because of rape culture, because we don't believe fake survivors, uh, because we're still... Uh, we, we don't we, we still don't believe survivors and that's why many survivors keep their stories to themselves so the goal of this hashtag was was to really share a story of of uh, sexual assault but in which it was never reported to the police or even shared to anyone before and it really got a, a major impact at the time uh, in 2016 we had another wave so as you can see like there's almost like two years difference between each wave in Quebec uh, so stop culture de viol, which means stop rape culture. Um, it was launched by an indigenous artist ca called Natasha Canapé Fontaine, um, and it was in the aftermath of um, a news report uh, investigation that was done by uh, Radio Canada, which is the national uh, television network here and 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 Quebec in Canada. So they did an investigation and they 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 came to the conclusion. Uh, basically, they took testimonies of indigenous women in Val d'Or, which is a region in Quebec, and these indigenous women were being sexually assaulted by police officers, so they were being assaulted by those who were supposed to protect them, and it created a huge um, scandal, even though indigenous people have been sharing those stories for a long time and were just not taken seriously when they were sharing those stories, um, and the government decided to launch a commission called the Vien Commission, uh, and this commission led to report on um, the relation between indigenous people and different uh, social services or public services in Quebec. And what's interesting is that when you look at the report uh, that was um, released in 2019, so a few years later, the, the indigenous women were the reason why we did, we did this commission and the reason why we did this report are almost absent of the, the final product. We, it's almost, I don't think they're even mentioned in the report, uh, even though it's because of their courage that there was this commission. Um, there, there was also cases in universities. So there was, uh, there was a, someone who assaulted um, women in residences and at the University of Laval, and, which is a Quebec university. And there was also at the time the case of Jerry Sclavunas, who is who used to be a um, National Assembly MP in Quebec, uh, who was accused of uh, having sexually assaulted another woman, Alice Paquet. Um, and basically in this case, what happened is that the charges were basically dismissed, but Alice Paquet to this day claims that this really happened and that this is something that was not taken seriously. Even the media was really uh, horrible to her in this case. Uh, because what happened that is that she was at a protest, she shared a story, and then the media started uh, looking about which MP of the National Assembly she was talking about, uh, and basically just uh, kept going from there, and basically uh, it was really uh, horrendous the way she was treated by the press and the media in this case, but it, all these events really um, started another wave of some kind of Me Too movement before the actual Me Too movement in 2016, and then uh, the Me Too movement happened, so like I said, uh, with the Harvey Weinstein case in the United States. In Quebec, around, uh, around the same time, it really led to uh, similar, a similar movement, but a victim into crime, which means a victim will believe you. That's what it means. Um, and it's really important to note that the Me Too movement really, really had a huge impact in Quebec. So if you look at this graph, I don't know if you see it well, uh, but Quebec is the province in which there was the most reports to the police after the Me Too movement. 
uh, across Canada. So it's it's really like the highest percentage and it was with 61%. Uh, so there's something particular about this province that makes uh, lots of people uh, talk about their stories, share their stories, but it doesn't mean that because people are sharing their stories that they necessarily believe um, and people are not necessarily like, just because people report to the police doesn't mean that it leads to criminal convictions or that it leads to some kind of accountability. But it makes the issue being talked uh, a lot of, talked uh, um, about a lot more um, in Quebec, and it it really had a huge impact even on on the media, on um, on uh, policies, on laws. Uh, and I'm just going to go into a minute into more of that. Um, Gilbert Rozon and Eric Salvay are two public personalities that were really really successful in Quebec. Um, Gilbert Rozon is a man who founded the Just for, uh, Just for Laugh. Uh, festival here in Quebec, which is a um, humoristic festival with lots of comedians and stuff like that. Uh, he was accused by multiple of uh, dozens of women of having sexually assaulted them. Um, there was also a news report investigation, similar like the New York Times and the New Yorker, but done by local Quebec media about these two public personalities. Uh, basically, now they're they're uh, they're not they're not in the visible uh, public eye anymore. Uh, but when the, uh, those two were charged and there were trials uh, regarding those cases and they were both acquitted, uh, even though there were many, many, many women who came forward um, against those two. Um, Eric Salai was a TV, um, he's still alive, but he was a TV uh, public personality, really, really successful in Quebec and basically got... Um, he got also accused, there was a trial and he got acquitted. They were both acquitted in the same week on December 2020. And those two were kind of the symbol of the Me Too movement in Quebec. So for a lot of survivors, it was really like um, disappointing. Like for many years, survivors have been speaking up in a sense. And for it was a, a, a sign of a lack of accountability. I'm not necessarily for criminal criminalization of people, uh, but it, it means that there's something wrong with our system when, um, when when people are coming forward and they're not believed, and there seems to be a lack of accountability across the board, uh, when like dozens of women are coming forward and none of them are able to 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 get some kind of justice um, with, with those two cases. So I'm sorry if I'm speaking a little bit fast, but I'll I'll, I'll put some time at the end for questions if you need to need to clarify certain things. But this slide really shows that in Quebec. There's something particular about uh, the Me Too movement in Canada because it's really it seems to have the biggest impact. Um, also, one statistic that is really important to remember uh, in Quebec we have rape crisis shelters uh, that we call uh, CALAPS, so Centre d'aide de lutte aux agressions caractère sexuel. Uh, and during the second week of the Me Too movement, when it was at, at its peak, uh, some uh, CALAPS in Quebec. Uh, recorded like an increase in more than 500% in requests for services. Uh, so survivors were calling, calling, calling to, to get help, to get support. Um, so there was an increase of almost uh, 100 to 500%, uh, depending on which CALAC in Quebec you were talking about. And um, the government gave money to those resources to, to help them, like uh, respond to the demand. Uh, but it's it's not enough, and they're still like um, they're still like managing like because we had another wave in July 2020, like I mentioned earlier. So they're still managing like the the increase in and in requests for services and uh, the burnout of the workers because they're working very very hard because they're getting so many requests at the same time. Um, and just working in the field of trauma, it can be really exhausting. Um, so there's not enough support to do that. And and when it comes to black women and girls. Often those uh, mainstream services are not um, culturally safe for those women. So they're even left out even more. Um, sometimes you don't even feel the strength to talk about it because the services that we have in Quebec are not uh, adapted, like the public services are not adapted for uh, cultural diversity and, and, um, and the fact that some black women don't want to rely on prisons and criminalization to, to get justice and accountability. So, um, Black women have been really active in, in different uh, circles to make sure that um, uh, there's some form of justice and accountability that, that doesn't rely on those uh, mainstream services, but I, I'll get into that in two, a minute. Um, so yes, so in July 2020, 
uh, there was really a shift because when this wave of the Me Too movement came again, um, it really resembled uh, Balance Ton Port in France, which means that people were naming abusers. So before the, the previous, previous waves of sexual assault allegations on social media, people were more sharing their own stories without naming uh, necessarily someone specifically. But in this wave in July 2020, uh, there were lists of abusers that uh, survivors had compiled on anonymous pages on Instagram. Uh, so Dissonant, which means say his name, uh, victim's voices. There were many, many pages and it was really, um, really intense to watch this because people were calling out pe uh, people who were famous in Quebec, but also uh, citizens. And there was, and this list is still online. And it led to uh, the backlash of this. Uh, so the, the alleged abusers uh, who were named on those lists uh, basically uh, started suing one by one uh, the administrators of those anonymous pages. Uh, so the, the story is still ongoing. We don't know what's going to happen with all those um, uh, lawsuits. Uh, but some lawyers have, have mentioned, some people who are working in the field of law, they're not a majority of them, but some of them have mentioned that uh, this is a way to, re um, those lawsuits are a way to intimidate survivors and to really uh, shut down um, their freedom of speech. And some even mentioned that uh, it's a misuse of the concept in a sense prevent prevent guilty uh, because survivors have also a right to freedom of speech and it's often not mentioned and that uh, you cannot, um, basically it's, it's a way to, to not talk about this issue socially by using this concept to, to stop the conversation and this is a backlash that is still ongoing and uh, we're, we're gonna find out in a couple of months of years uh, what's going to happen with all those uh, lawsuits and defamations against the, the people who were uh, behind those anonymous pages. Um, but it was really scary, like the, the number of names that were on, on this list, it was, um, it really shows that it's a, a, a huge public health crisis. Sexual violence across the world is a huge problem and because of the shortcomings of the criminal justice system, of the, of the social services network, uh, survivors are, are going on social media and sharing their stories there because they feel, they feel there's not other way to gain justice, accountability, and reparation uh, because we, we, we have major work to do across the world, but including in, in Quebec as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so why do survivors go on social media? Uh, because there's a lot of shortcomings in the criminal justice system. Um, survivors want to be believed. They want to be listened to. Um, they want to have a community around them. They want to speak their truth and their own ways with their own words. Um, and they want to have control over the narrative of what's happening to them. Uh, some survivors share their stories and share names on, this, on those lists because they wanted to protect other potential, potential victims. So even if some of them try to report to the police or even try to report to, to their institution, that doesn't mean that it will lead to more protection for other victims. So for some survivors, it was the only way to, to, to raise awareness about someone who had really a problematic behavior. Uh, but they also want to have a cultural and so, so, um, society change when it comes to this issue. And it's also, social media is a way for a lot of marginalized communities uh, to regain power, uh, not only a uh, woman or black woman, but I think people who are, who are from marginalized, um, historically marginalized groups uh, can find a lot of power in social media because the mainstream media tends to not cover those stories or to not take, in, take them as seriously because the, the environment in, the, in traditional media is still uh, led by white men in general. So that leads in a lot of biases in the way that those stories are covered, if they're covered at all. At all. So some, these are some of the reasons why uh, survivors go on social, social media. Um, in 2021, uh, there was this movie called La Parfaite Victime, which means the perfect victim. Um, I was in this movie as a survivor um, and it led to a lot of um, um, controversy in Quebec because uh, the, the people who did this movie uh, were accused by the, the, um, like the people in law, people in the field of law were like saying, you're, you're discouraging survivors of going to the police and of reporting. 
And they responded back, no, we're not discouraging them. They were already discouraged and we're just showing them what's their process of, of going to court and the police and everything. So in this movie, um, the, there's again, like it's not even, Tarana Burke is not even mentioned. They talk about the Me Too movement, but they're not mentioning Tarana Burke. They talked about uh, the, um, I have, I'm having a blank, um, um, the the intern in the, in the early 90s who um, um, reported it against uh, Clarence Thomas. I'm just forgetting her name now. Um, can someone tell me her name? Anita Hill, exactly. Yes, Anita Hill. Uh, they talked about Anita Hill, but they're not mentioning like the, the race and gender dynamics that were specific to her case. So again, there seemed to be a, a, some kind of erasure of of black women in, in this movie as well. Um, and something that's interesting is that it, it, the, the argument for the people who did this movie was we need to make the system better. Um, but for a lot of black feminists and uh, black uh, people who are working in this field, the question is, is this even the, the right system for us? Is, it, is the criminal system, can it even protect us? Um, and this question is rarely asked in Quebec. It's rarely even discussed, uh, which is unfortunate because we're talking about improving a system, but we're not asking ourselves, is it the right system at all? Um, and I think this question deserves some thought. But even if this movie was talking about improving the system, it, it, it was a huge controversy because people in the field of law were like seeing, this is not the reality, this is not true. Uh, it led to a huge backlash on that side, but people working with survivors were saying, yes, this is uh, true to the reality of survivors who are going through the system. So uh, we'll see what's going to happen from there, but it led to a lot of discussion uh, in the media. Um, and in December 2020, um, there was this report called uh, Rebattir la Confiance, which means rebuilding trust. Uh, it's basically rebu rebuilding trust with the criminal justice system because the Quebec government, when it saw that uh, so many people were going on social media, th what they understood is that, oh, we need to make the criminal system better. So that was their understanding of the of those social movements, while it's a lot more complex than that. Um, so they did a report with um, 190 recommendations um, to make the system better, but also to like, not only on the criminal system, but they talked about um, improving services for survivors, community services, social services. Uh, they talked about uh, having services for people who, who, who do sexual assault to others. Um, but there's many issues and um, that I observed when you look at the report, um, the committee of experts, I think there were about uh, 19 people, if I recall correctly, but there were not many people on this committee. Um, the voices of survivors were largely absent. There was only one person who is um, uh, a woman who, who sued uh, Gilbert Rozon, who sat on the committee to, to represent the voices of survivors. But other people on the committee were mostly uh, like researchers, community workers. Um, there was someone who represented indigenous communities, uh, but there was not a strong representation of black people in this committee. Uh, there was not a representation of survivors, so I think this led to some kind of um, bias to a certain extent uh, because we didn't see the voices of the people who were most concerned by this issue being basically at the table. Um, I, I'm not saying that the report is 100% bad. I think there were some good recommendations, but I think we can, we can ask ourselves like why are not black people again at the, at the table? And I think it's important to mention also, um, um, like I said, Quebec is a francophone a minority in Canada, in North America, basically. And because uh, it sees itself as a minority group, often they don't see that they can oppress other minority groups as well uh, within the same uh, community. So very often it leads to erasure of uh, racialized people, Black people. It's very hard to find uh, stats about Black women in, in Canada and Quebec, it's even worse. Um, so this Erasure is really difficult. And because Quebec um, has this sense of um, uh, insecurity because, oh, we're, we're the only uh, francophone minority in North America, so we're gonna disappear. There's this sense of insecurity and very often it leads to a denial of, of systemic racism. Um, 
I mentioned earlier that I was uh, chosen uh, at the UN to speak about systemic racism uh, in Quebec. And one thing that's really uh, distinctive in Canada and Quebec is that it's really there's a denial of systemic racism. There's a denial that slavery existed here. Um, of indigenous and black people, uh, for example, uh, we start to talk about a bit more because of the George Floyd and because of the efforts of activists for many decades and even more. Uh, but there's really a resistance to even recognize that this is part of our history to very often uh, the discourse in Quebec is to say that, oh, it's worse in the US, so we don't have anything to do with black people here. And there's many black people here and we just don't see ourselves represented in many spheres and research is, is even worse. Um, uh, for example, uh, that's why I'm doing this doctoral work because I was reading that um, only 2% of tenured professors in Canada are black. Uh, I don't have the numbers for Quebec, but I'm assuming it's even lower. And for black women, I'm assuming it's even lower, even lower than that. Um, and I think that's a, that's an issue. That's, there's this resistance recognizing to center the voices of black people in, in Quebec that is really, really um, distinctive and and a bit, uh, not a bit, but it's it's violent at the same time because uh, we're being invisibilized and not uh, recognized as, as humans who are who are able to produce uh, research. Um, so, like I said, uh, like activist Mar Marianne Lopez, she she lives in, in Montreal and she she's a uh, black feminist activist. And like I said, um, the the conversation regarding prison abolition, regarding uh, if is is criminalization even the best way to protect survivors? Uh, this conversation is really difficult to have in Quebec. Um, for example, um, last year when after the George Floyd uh, death. Uh, people started talking about um, like a defund the police and and most citizens were for defund the police to uh, redirect those funds for community services to help the community. Um, and suddenly in the Quebec media, most of the Quebec media, there was a focus on uh, police violence and, and gangs and, and, and all these things. Um, so at every time there's a discussion of defund the police, there's suddenly like an increase in the media about um, violence in our streets, uh, for example. And and some people think it's a way to uh, manipulate the public opinion regarding uh, this issue. And I think it's something that's not a uh, stranger to feminist um, feminism as well in Quebec. So there's many dynamics like that uh, that are really hard to explain. But um, like I said, like during the Me Too movement, um, many people were pointing out that we erase the black women who are, who are like the leaders of this movement. The same thing happened in, in Quebec. Um, so like it, basically those headlines are mentioning that um, women of, of color, black women are not uh, rendered visible here when it comes to these issues. Uh, and it's a huge problem because uh, we experience also rates of sexual violence just like in any community, but we're not uh, as well, we, we, we're not, um, we don't, we don't have access to the same services as other as white women, for example. So this leads, leads to a lot of, of issues. So basically, a lot of black women are suffering in silence and there's, there's not much access to culturally safe services for, for our communities. Um, yeah, so that, that I said, like people who are, who are um, I, sh I should have put this slide before, but um, there's a lot of backlash when it comes to uh, reporting on social media, like stories of sexual violence. Um, and even like the access to the internet, it might seem weird, but in Canada, there are some communities who don't have access to the internet. So they cannot share their stories online like a lot of white women can do or a lot of people can do, or even feeling safe to do so, even if you have access to the internet. Uh, like I said, like all the, the, the defamation label intimidation of survivors um, and the, the overexposition to trauma online, like all these things are really issues that we need to think about to make this movement more equitable and to make sure that it reaches uh, all survivors, not just white women, for example. Um, but I wanna mention that there's, um, also, there's impacts still to those movements. I, I don't wanna think that there's no impact in Quebec, uh, the Me Too movement and all those movements that I mentioned earlier, um, it led to um, policy changes and laws being adopted in Quebec. So, for instance, um, we had Bill 151 that got adopted a few years ago. 
uh, basically it's a, it's a law that um, forces all uh, colleges and, and universities in, in Quebec to have a policies to to uh, tackle and prevent sexual assault on, on campuses. Um, and, and, and there's going to be an equivalent in uh, high schools and elementary schools as well. Uh, there was also a lot of media coverage about the topic. So you can see there's a shift a little bit in the conversation because it's being more uh, talked about. Uh, but very often, Black women, like I said, are really uh, rendered invisible. And it's really something that's being brought up a lot more, uh, more and more. Um, and for Black women, there's a lot of specific issues, like the, the stereotypes that were being uh, subjected to. Uh, and if a Black woman uh, is, is being sexually assaulted by another Black, black person, very often it's going to feel like people are going to say, oh, it's because of their culture. It's because it's, it's it's, that, that's the way they are, rather than saying that it's because of structural inequalities that come from slavery, from colonization, uh, from systemic racism. It, they're not going to address like the systemic reasons. They're going to talk about the culture of those people. And when we think of the fact that sexual violence happens to to people all over the world, um, and also the issue of criminalization and racial profiling. So as we know, uh, black people are more profiled. They're more criminalized. So when you tell a black woman, oh, just report to the police, it's for some of us, it's just not an option because you're, it can be seen as being a traitor to your own community. So we need to expand the options that we're offering to survivors. Uh, the not good victim archetype, like I said, uh, having access to cultural, culturally safe services. Um, the denial of systemic racism is a huge issue because within the feminist movement, um, there's a denial that there's racism within the feminist movement in Quebec, and this is a huge problem. Um, and there's ways that Black women have been really active to tackle these issues. Um, I'm thinking about the Third Eye Collective, which is a collective in Montreal of uh, Black women who are really doing uh, transformative justice work uh, at the grassroots level uh, for survivors. Um, and there's also um, an initiative that is uh, coming up called uh, Stop Les Violences Sexuelles in Montreal North, which is a, um, a region of Montreal where there's a lot of Black people, uh, particularly from Haiti, and they're working on uh, building a resource for, that is culturally safe for people who are living there. And across Canada and the United States, there's other initiatives that we can get inspired from. Uh, but we need to to make sure that we don't that we center our voices when we do this initiative and that we protect also our work uh, because it can get corrupted very easily. So I think it's important to to keep that in mind. Um, I just want to know how how am I doing for time? You're doing great, Carolyn. You're doing okay. great. Yeah, you have as much time as you need. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so this is a model that uh, would stop the genosexual are trying to get inspired from. Uh, it was started by Camilla Johnson uh, in Detroit, so in the United States. Um, and she built, the, built this model with uh, people of the community to really explain like the specific uh, realities of Black women who are experiencing sexual violence. So there's um, like, peop uh, like slavery as an impact, systemic barriers, uh, society barriers, culture, and, like all these things have an impact. Um, and it's really like a culturally safe approach to uh, an Afrocentric approach to tackling sexual violence against uh, Black women and girls. So I think this is something we can get inspired from. It's a it's a good model, and I think it's important to to keep in mind that um, very often when Black women are not centered um, uh, like in, in this way, very often the services are not adapted to our realities and what we're going through. Um, and when it comes to intersectionality, it's really interesting because um, all these initiatives for me have an intersectional approach, uh, even if it doesn't necessarily say so, but like, like the, the Oud Stop Event Success for me, it's, it's intersectional. Uh, the Third Eye Collective for me is something that's really intersectional. Uh, but in Quebec, um, around the early 2000s, uh, that's when intersectionality really started to become more popular uh, in Quebec. Uh, especially in academia, feminist research. Um, and it's really interesting because uh, this uh, article written by uh, Surma Bilge, uh, she's a soci sociologist at the University of Montreal, and she talked about how um, intersectionality got uh, co-opted basically by white women. And, and 
The first se sentence of the article um, is citing, uh, I think it's Barbara Christian, a black feminist uh, scholar who had predicted that this would happen, that it would be really uh, ironic if um, intersectionality would become like really popular in academia, but that black women would not be full participants in this uh, research. And in Quebec, you can, it's really what, what happened. It's really what happened. Um, like for instance, when I, I do my research, uh, the people that I see in academia for the most part are often white women working on this, on intersectionality. And this leads to all kinds of um, issues uh, and biases when you have uh, white women working on theories that are coming from black women and black women's activism. So it can feel a bit lonely and isolating sometimes in academia, because like I said earlier, uh, there's not many of us out there in academia, black women, for example. Uh, so you, you have colleagues who are working on intersectionality, but they're not black. Uh, and that's, that's an issue. Um, and it, and it, it's not because black activists or black people are not here. There's just no link. They're, they're working on, the, on this topic um, on their own and they're not actively uh, working in collaboration or partnership with black people who are living here. Um, and that's an issue because for example, if you had um, a group of men who would be doing research on feminism people would be out, outraged here. Like people would say, it's not acceptable. They're not legitimate. Why are they working on this topic? Uh, they're not, they're not uh, allies by doing that. Uh, but for some reason for intersectionality, it's tolerated that a lot of white women are working on this topic without having uh, long-term links with um, black people in Quebec. So that's a huge issue. Um, and basically what, what, um, what it's like, it's it, what the Barbara Christian had predicted, basically that's what happened a few years later, basically. Um, I, I even have one example that I have in mind. Um, last year, uh, after I did my op-ed in La Presse, um, I was invited to speak at a, um, like a course on intersectionality at the Quebec University that I won't mention, uh, but the entire class, like the students, there were all white students. Um, and there's even like three, three people who came to the course were not registered, were black people. Uh, the teacher was a white woman. Um, so like when this theory became um, academic, it like white people are the ones who were benefiting from this theory while like all the black people that I know were organizing protests and all doing these things are not participating are not in the classrooms where they should be thought about those theories. So that's an really, uh, I had a shock when I, when I saw the class because when I entered the class, like, almost all the students were white. Uh, everyone in the room was white and they wanted, they were studying intersectionality. So that's an example of um, the whitening of intersectionality. Um, so basically uh, the U United Nations uh, basically called out Canada a few years ago um, for, for a lot of issues because Yes, there's there's things that got better over the years when it comes to black women and and black uh, people and policies and research, but it's still it's not it's not enough. It's really not enough. Uh, for instance, there's a there's a huge lack of race based uh, data, and that's what I'm trying to tackle with my research, uh, with my doctoral research. I'm trying to produce data that is centered for for black people um, in Quebec and French. Uh, because there's more research about Black people done uh, in the rest of Canada or in English, but in French, it's very hard to find uh, data, to find research, find stats. Uh, and very often, um, the data is not like academic, typical research. It's, it's in movies, it's in uh, op-eds that activists write in, in the media, but it's not considered legitimate uh, research. Um, so I, it, it, there's all these issues that you have to navigate when you're doing research in academia as a black woman. So I'm trying to tackle this issue that the, the United Nations noticed uh, when it comes to race-based uh, data. And they also mentioned that they did a recommendation that's important to have uh, policies um, that really talk about the inequalities that uh, women of African descent face in Canada, because very often, um, here in Canada, the word, the word that we use often is a uh, visible minority, which was coined by a black woman, which is ironic, but this term has become a, like a, a term where all racialized people are being put together. 
Um, so there's no distinction about like the realities of, of black people when you use that term. It's really like visible minority, racialized people, uh, immigrant, but some black people are not immigrants. So there's all these dis distinctions that are not being made, um, which basically it becomes a word that doesn't say much because there's so many people who are like put in that category. Um, so we need more res research done by black people for black people who really centers uh, the experiences of, of people of African descent in Canada. And uh, because there's not many of us in academia, um, it creates like a, a barrier to, to doing that research. Um, and, and I'm trying to tackle this issue, but I, I hope I won't be the only one because it's really heavy to be the only one in academia in, white, in a white space where you're, that was not built for me. Uh, but I think there needs to be many, many more of us. And there's a couple of us, I'm thinking of, of Delis Mugavo, uh, I'm thinking of Natalie Batraville, who are researchers in, in Canada who are doing this work, Robin Maynard also. Um, but we need to be a lot more because we need to tell our stories for ourselves and by ourselves um, because uh, we need to document like our activism and our work um, uh, and research as well, I think. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to do with my research. And yes. Um, so I'm still early on in the process. So, um, so if you have suggestions uh, of things I should read, of uh, people I should contact to really um, produce something that is meaningful for Black people in Quebec, uh, feel free to, to reach out to me. Uh, I always take uh, advice and suggestions. I really appreciate it all the time. Um, and I think it's important to, that there's more of us because I, it does feel lonely sometimes in academia to be... Um, the only black person in the room <laughs> or the first black person in the room or it's it feels it's a huge burden sometimes i'm proud to be to get to have gotten there because i'm the first one of my family uh, to have a university degree but that creates like dynamics that are sometimes not easy to navigate uh, and i'm sure it's the same in the us as well especially when you're dealing with uh, such sensitive topics and being a survivor myself uh, but i'm trying to do my best and i hope you appreciated this presentation and hopefully it wasn't too uh, confusing. <laughs> so I'm going to leave the rest of the time for questions. Uh, thank you for, for listening uh, to me. Wow, thank you so much, Carol Ann, for such an amazing and informative teaching. I'm over here sitting, you know, just just trying to take in everything that you were talking about and how important it is for it, how important it is for us, particularly myself who's who lives in the United States and was born here, to have a global perspective on what is going on around the world, particularly how uh, politics. Um, impact black women and gender expansive folks. And like I say, Canada is often neglected when we just discuss black feminisms and black politics. So really, really wanna thank you so much for this presentation. I wanna, before we get into questions, cause I know you've been speaking for a while, I wanna give you a little <laughs> break, right? But yeah. I wanna hear something, um, a comment that someone said on um, the School for Black Feminist Politics Instagram. I think Alicia, forgive me if I'm saying your name incorrectly, wrote to you, wow, what a powerful presentation. I'm in awe. Thank you for all that you do for Black women in Quebec and worldwide. So thank you. I'm trying my best to do the best I can with at my levels. I can say like that. But there's a lot of work to be done. Um, sometimes it's, it's ironic because um, in Quebec, like when we want to talk about racism here, uh, where the response is always, oh, but it's worse in the U.S. We're not that bad. It, it's it's often like the the response, but at least in the U.S., it feels like you can have this conversation. Here, it's always like, um, uh, does systemic racism exist? And it, it's the same question for like thirty years. So, so it gets like a, in the loop, you know. And and because we don't want to acknowledge that it exists, because Quebec is the only province in Canada that doesn't recognize formally systemic racism for politics reasons, uh, because it doesn't recognize the issue, well, we, we can't have solutions because there's no recognition of the issue. So sometimes it, it gets uh, a bit annoying. <laughs> I was on mute. Well, I just wanna say that um, what you're doing is so radical, what you're doing is so revolutionary and don't be too hard on yourself because you're already doing amazing, amazing work and your work is needed, right? Because you are, um, forcing academia, white folks in Quebec and Canada, and just globally 
to see black women and gender expansive people who've been left out purposely um, mm-hmm. in these critical discourses. And quickly, I just want to read uh, Jihan in the comments said, thank you so much for this presentation. Chris said, you did amazing, so insightful. All of your work and energy is appreciated. And Alicia, again, thank you. Oh my God, girl, you are doing great. I'm in my undergrad, so I can't even imagine getting to my PhD. You give me hope. So <laughs> it's, funny, it's funny for this comment because when I was an undergrad, I never thought I would do a PhD. I, I never thought I would go to university at all. So it's really funny now that I'm doing a PhD. So I think it's a step-by-step thing. Yeah. But I'm sure you can do it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you can. So I'm just going to hop into one of the first questions. So Alicia, thank you for your question. Um, They asked, with your extensive experience in working in the field of trauma, what self-care practices have you picked up along the way? Thank you for all that you do. Um, one of the things that I do every day since I'm a kid, I listen to music, like, uh, at least like one to three hours every day while I'm taking walks. Um, it's really important for me to do that, to just do something that has nothing to do with work. Um, I also have like, um, like my community and academia, I have allies who are not necessarily black people. Sometimes they are, but sometimes not. Um, who are like really sensitive about my position in academia and you are protecting me, mentoring me, giving me advice. So that's really precious. Um, having a good nights of sleep. <laughs> it, it sounds basic, but we need to sleep to do this work. To I need to rest. Um, but basically, uh, music has been a huge one for me and, and sharing my experience with other folks who get it. Um, I think it's really important because I, it feels, I feel sometimes lonely in academia because uh, um, I'm kind of an anomaly in all sense of the term in this and those spaces. And I think uh, I appreciate it when some people recognize that and try to support me, like uh, older professors or uh, tenure professors who are giving me advice to make sure that uh, I can do this work for a long time. So I really feel it's important to find who are your allies in this, in this space. Thank you so much for that response. Um, and that was such a wonderful question too. So thank you, Alicia, for your for your question. So this comment is from our YouTube live chat. So mm-hmm. Lowell, forgive me if I'm saying your name incorrectly, but their question is, I've heard from a few other Canadians from different provinces that Quebec is a, a statistical outlier. Crime is higher, including the rare gun crime and mass shooting, which is more frequent in the province, more white nationalist movement centered in Quebec. Does Caroline agree with this? And if so, might it skew the stats in Canada overall? Is the Moasi problem a Quebec centered problem? And I'll, I'll put all those, those questions uh, in the chat. Okay. Um, about the stats on crime, I'm not aware if it's worse in Quebec or in or in Canada. And it, it always depends how those stats are collected, uh, who has done those studies, uh, how they define crime. It always depends on this. Uh, when it comes to the Mausi movement, like I mentioned, Quebec is the province in which it led to uh, the more the most reports to the police. But I don't think it's because there's more sexual assault in Quebec necessarily. I think it's because um, um, the feminist network here is really strong. And because we're kind of a, a, a micro society within North America, I should say like that, I think there's all those dynamics at play uh, more than, I don't think there's more sexual assault in Quebec than the rest of Canada. I, th- I think it's a worldwide issue. Uh, but I think because of the strength of the feminist network here um, and some cultural um aspects uh, regarding certain elements. I think it's it's all these things that lead to more people reporting um, to the police. Also, like uh, the high profile cases that we have here in Quebec, um, Quebec is really close to it's like uh, stars and like um, TV personalities. So I think it creates a big shock when one of them is being accused of having done something like this. Um, so I think it's a, it's a mix of all these things. Um, and what was the other question? Uh, yes, there's there are white nationalist uh, movements here in Quebec, but I think they do exist across Canada, to be honest. Uh, but yes, there's a there's a there's a some people who are against immigration or against um, uh, recognizing systemic racism. Um, but I think it's an issue that exists 
across the country. I don't have the numbers for that, but yes, it does exist. There is that uh, polarization that exists here. Um, but I don't know if it's worse than elsewhere. So very often when we say it's worse elsewhere, it's because we don't want to look at what's happening in our own home. Uh, and I think these issues, they exist they exist everywhere and there's a rise of white nationalist movements across the world. So I don't think it's something that's specific to to Quebec, but uh, I may be wrong, but that's my, that's my, my first uh, answer, answer, I would say. Thank you so much for um, just you know answering that question and interrogating it. And there's another question an anonymous attendee asked. Um, they asked in the chat by accident, accident if during the report, maybe the researchers and social workers at the table were also survivors, but preferred to not show up as survivors exactly. or authority or credibility. Yes, I think uh, many people who work in this field are often survivors, whether they, tell, they say it or not or they're connected to this issue for some reason, even if they don't want to talk about their personal story. Uh, but yes, sometimes for some people I'm, I'm seeing, like not as a researcher, but more as an activist because I share my own story. Um, and yeah, there's, there's that dynamic, like if you share your own story, you're seen as not objective uh, or not credible or not a real researcher. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's a problem because many of us are survivors or are, you know, are just not seeing it. But the people who were invited to, to this committee, um, they were invited as experts, um, but there was not, to my knowledge, there was no, not like people representing black people. Uh, there was not many diversity within the people who were in that committee. And that obviously leads to biases to a certain extent. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. And then also Alicia shared, um, in the chat, I'm just going to plug this here. One of the good things Concordia University has done in spite of long history or, or white supremacy, see ninth floor, um, all black perspectives. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, I guess, a resource of, mm -hmm. um, of scholarship on black perspectives in Canada. Yes, yes. And I think it's important to mention also that the Concordia has been the site of a lot of black resistance in Montreal. Um, there were like a, a many decades ago, uh, black students had a huge protest there that was historic. So I think that's why uh, there's more of those, those types of initiatives at Concordia because there's that history. Um, um, like I'm thinking of the Sir uh, George William affair. So basically, what happened at the time is that there was a professor who gave who, who failed like all the black students uh, for just for no reason. And they protested, they did, they did, uh, the police came and some of them were arrested, got into jail. So it was a huge thing. And, and, and it's, it was really like something that's, um, that really galvanized the, the black resistance and activism um, and, and Quebec in the, seven, in the 70s, even in Canada. So I think that's why there's more of those resources at Concordia because there's this history, it was on the site of the Concordia University. So it's probably why. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I have one question selfishly. Um, <laughs> I'm always interested in what it means to be a transnational Black feminist. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, I will say that me being a Black woman in the United States, our perspectives of, of Black people in the United States are at the foreground of oftentimes Black feminisms and Black politics, um, and just mm -hmm. politics generally. So what can particularly Black feminists in the U.S. and in the diaspora do more to ensure that we're centering our sisters and siblings in, mm -hmm. in Canada? Um, what, what, what steps do you think we should take to um, make sure we interrogate more about Black feminist politics in, in Canada and Qu Quebec particularly? Um, I think very often there's this narrative about Canada that it's like the perfect place to live for, and that there's no racism there, there's no issues there. So I think we need to um, challenge that narrative because it's, it's just not true that we have issues here too as well. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that. Um, another thing I would mention also, it, it might not seem connected, but um, the history of the Asian revolution, like we're, we were talking about Haiti uh, earlier, um, but Haiti is basically the first state uh, who abolished uh, slavery in our history. Um, and I was reading uh, an historian, her name is uh, Marlene Doe, 
And she was saying that the Asian revolution is the first Black Lives Matter movement in our history. It, it, like the, the idea of anti-racism, of all humans, all humans are, uh, have the right to dignity and respect, it comes from the Asian revolution. And I think if we can go back to that history of that revolution, I think it can lead to more freedom for all Black people across the world. So I think it's really, um, it's a really a strong story, like the history of the Haitian Revolution, or even reading the the Declaration of Independence of Haiti is really powerful as well. Uh, it's in French, but it's really powerful, like the whole history behind the Haitian Revolution. And I think we need to remember that history because it, the the goal was, was that nobody should be slaves, nobody should be um, like not not well treated. And I think we need to go back to that history to remember that we need to be uh, solid, like have solidarity for all black people across the world because um, in different shape or form we're, we're having to deal with some of the same struggles very often. Thank you for that. That was a wonderful response and always centering Haiti. Um, I, like I said, in the beginning of the conversation, as Carol Ann said, uh, please keep Haiti in your thoughts and prayers and always stand in solidarity with Haiti as today um, just suffering a, a massive earthquake. So thank you so much. And always keep in mind the revolution and the power of, mm -hmm. of Haiti. So, and this is the last question an anonymous attendee asks, what term do you think is more prominent for Black people who identify with feminism, Black feminist, womanist, or feminist? And I'm not sure if this was in the Canadian context or just generally, but um, that was the, one of the questions. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, usually I'm, I'm more for people choosing to identify as they wish. Um, so I would never tell someone you should identify as this or as this. So I think it's something that that um, a choice that is personal and, and for different political reasons that people should, should have the right to to choose for, for themselves. So that would be my, my answer. <laughs> um, it's not a perfect answer, but I think it's important to leave people like their self-determination around um, around this. Um, yeah, <laughs> but because for some people, feminism is not relevant because it's like, it, re it uh, reminds of white feminism, but for some people, it's not the case. Uh, I guess it, it really depends. I don't have a perfect answer for that. <laughs> well, I'm just going to pop back on the screen, even though I don't always like to be on the screen and forgive me all my fans blowing in my face, but I just <laughs> want to say thank you so much, Carol Ann, for your work, your leadership, your activism, your your commitment to centering Black women um, and, and political discourses and particularly around the Me Too movement. Um, i so thankful that you reached out and I was so drawn by your proposal um, that I knew this was going to be amazing. And I'm so excited to learn more from you when your book gets published. I would love an <laughs> autograph, I mean, a, you know, a signed copy, but um, this is what Black Mar Radicals is for, is to center the amazing work people are doing. Um, and I just hope this conversation resonated with our viewers. Um, I know people have several comments um, and are sharing it on Twitter. So once again, just thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And on, um, to everyone in the audience, this conversation will live on Black Mar Radicals YouTube. And so please feel free to go back and reference. And also there will be, there will be a reading list, which I'm excited yeah. about that Carol Ann will share and we'll post that later on. But please, you know, follow Carol Ann on Twitter um, and Instagram. Please support <laughs> her work. Um, and also just really interrogate the leadership of Black women in Canada, Black women and gender expansive people who are doing the work. Um, because we need to know about various strategies and initiatives so that we can really get free and be in community mm -hmm. and solidarity with one another. So Carol Ann, are there any last words that you would like to say before we close this amazing teaching that you did? Um, I was just thinking like when I was uh, talking about the Asian revolution, it's ironic because today uh, it's August 14th and it's the day uh, like many centuries ago, um, it was the start of the Asian Revolution, like this, the ceremony at Bwakaima in 80, uh, was on August 14, uh, 17, 1791. Um, and that was the start of the Asian Revolution. So it's ironic that there's a her earthquake on the same day, basically. I was thinking about, about that. It's ironic there's an earthquake. It's ironic that you're, you know, led a teaching, an amazing teaching today. Um, and it's not, I think it's important that it shows how connected we are and how we continue, we need to continue to be connected. And so mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Carol Ann. You are a badass and I appreciate <laughs> you so much. Um, and thank you to everyone who uh, came in on a Saturday to, to learn from the amazing Carol Ann Soufrant. And hopefully you will tune in um, for more teachings. And just, just a disclaimer before um, I close this wonderful conversation that the School for Black Feminist Politics centers and, and pays Black feminists to lead these amazing teachings for free, right? And we do this work because it's so important that Black feminist activists, organizers, educators, their work is known um, and, and centered. So we have a fundraiser going on um, to open a physical location for the School for Black Feminist Politics in the greater Washington, D.C. area. So hopefully Carol Ann can come to D.C. one day and lead a teaching. So if you would like to support, please feel free to click the link in our bio on um, Black More Radicals on Instagram or on Twitter. And, you know, please donate whatever you can so that we can open up a physical location for the School for Black Feminist Politics. So thank y'all so much, Carol Ann. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I hope we thank stay you. <laughs> Thanks to everyone for being so kind with me. <laughs> Did an amazing job. Thank y'all so much. Thank Bye, you. Bye everyone.